I've been having probably a little bit too much fun with Orbis. If you recall in my last contextual linked below, I asked you to ask me what you'd like me to focus in on in my next film. And many of you have said that you wanted me to look at more of the kind of electronic material found in Orbis. If you recall, David Fanshawe, world-renowned adventurer, sound recordist, composer and photographer travelled the world capturing now extinct cultures, traditions in the shape of the largest world music library ever created. And we, with Jane Fanshawe, his widow, have curated some of that and have transmogrified it into its own plugin to become DNA for future generations of music makers. So I wanted to have a crack at doing some EDM music, but I can't keep up with you youngsters. So I thought I'd go back to my roots. Many of you may or may not be aware that I started out in the drum and bass, the original wave of kind of intelligent drum and bass with the likes of LTJ Bookham. And I also did quite a lot of music for hardcore porn films. That's my background. So I thought I'd just take it back to the old school and come up with a Bookham style drum and bass track that incorporates a lot of Orbis as the central kind of textural element of the piece. Alongside, and I have to guiltily admit, uh, this is the first first time I've ever used it, the eponymous aim and break. I've linked below a really good YouTube film about the most sampled break in the history of mankind. But before we get to that, let's have a look at how I built this track up. It's basically in three sections. It's a A section, a B section, and then what we would refer to back in the day as a rinse. I start with actually the modular piano, which is available free in labs, linked down below. <laughs> A lot of these clicks you'll hear are caused by AU pitch. I've been messing around with where the pitch center of this piece is to create a slightly more kind of hyped kind of tuning that gives it a bit of edge. This AU pitch plugin that I use on absolutely everything is a bit of, it's a bit glitchy when you start using it. So you'll see, for example, here, I actually put a note event there with all the volume down so it doesn't glitch. So if we go like that, hopefully it'll come in nice and clean. I basically just went through Orbis and had a look in the the sections that said pads and uh, you can filter stuff. I think what I did was filter it to distorted and twisted. Those kind of sounds are the ones that uh, we've mangled in the HQ. Uh, the team has done an amazing job taking the David Fanshawe recordings, which you do get the, the vanilla kind of original recordings in here as well, but also creating totally new sonic worlds. And it was so inspiring. This drum and bass track has taken probably about two and a half hours to do. So, you know, once you get into the flow with these amazing sounds, it really is something else. So, the first one that I heard that was like, okay, this is like our looping shash, as we would call it. It's a post office term for a continuous noise that's kind of pink. <laughs> adding quite a lot of top end. David's recordings, as I mentioned in my last tutorial, are, have a lovely kind of uh, retro warmth to them. So I find for this kind of EDM stuff, you want to hype a bit of the digital out of it a little bit. Other than that, I'm simply using the internal effects. If you recall, we have basically two sound sources. It's like a dual oscillator, but with samples. And so we've got a rack that just affects those bays independent of each other. Then you've got an aux effects, which is basically like a, a, an auxiliary return from the master effects send part of th that rack. The rest of these master effects are basically affecting the entire preset. All I've done is I've just taken the sound as, you know, as as opened from the factory floor and I've just put a little bit of high pass on. Just so you know, the cue of the high pass is, is that slider there. I've also inserted a single band EQ so I can filter in the top like a high pass filter. Matching the piano melody, I found this amazing sounding loop.
And what I've done here is I've separated the notes onto two tracks. You'll notice that the release here is quite long and here it's just that little bit shorter. This is because this dissonant note, it basically would kind of muddy the actual root note that we hit here. So I've separated those off into two different tracks. They're also triggering an enormous black hole reverb. Actually, when you pull that up, it's usually 20 seconds. I've taken that down to 8.5 seconds. And this is the FabFilter Pro R. The reason I love this is it's very intuitive to use. It's got some great presets, but also you don't need a dongle. I've also got a track called The Seagull, which again is playing that melody line and has a seagull-y kind of quality to it. And you can see that I've done some restorative kind of corrective EQ there. Uh, again, uh, this is me in very much mix mode, so mixing sounds in with each other, not necessarily feeling that that sound will be better with that EQ, it's more kind of fitting them all together. incredible sound there and I've also got this shimmer sound and this for me is the most book me bit here that note there I think is just I just absolutely love it again piles of reverb piles of delay I've got Yet another track that's kind of playing the top line. Finally, I've got this pad here, which I had to fiddle with our gate sequencer, uh, which is a lot of fun. And it also looks like a scary robot, which I think is quite cute. So if we have a look here, look, it's like we're playing his teeth. Just switch it out, so without. So what I did is extend this out, it kind of comes with like that. And so I extended the sequence length out and then I created this little glitchy bit at the end of it. So let's have a listen to that. And you can also smooth these in and out. And these, naturally, everything you can automate from Orbis or eDNA. You can see there's a huge number of parameters there that can be automated or indeed assigned to various different faders. Do that by standard kind of click and learn, move the fader and then it'll be attached to that parameter. So that's it for A with Orbis. Let me take you through some of the other elements I've come up with. So we had the modular piano up there, but I also employed this synth that I've fallen in love with called the Novation Summit, which I've got thankfully on loan from Novation and the guys at Focusrite. Thanks for loaning me that. I started with this sound and I just played it live and just used it as audio. And you can see I've corrected stuff and edited it together. And that for me is the approach with drum and bass. You've got to understand that this is from the, the hip hop, the dance hall tradition, the instruments are decks. So you've got to get into a mindset set of using and switching between sounds and loops and you'll see later on that there's points where I've imagined that it's like a crossfader on a deck so that things kind of get cut out without any reverb tails that kind of stuff And also found this beautiful swelling pad, which is, again, very kind of idiomatic of Bookham's work. If you check out his track, Horizons, that was a seminal moment, a transformative piece of music.
I'll return to the summit when we get to section B. You'll also notice I'm using some sounds that are purposefully a bit crap. Back in the day, you know, we were limited to the capabilities of hardware samplers. So a lot of people employed the use of things like JV 1080s to fill in the gaps that the samples couldn't fill. So a lot of the pads and stuff, but also a lot of the percussion instruments. So everyone had the same conga sounds. And indeed, these were quite popular from the MP sequences, the sound banks you found in those. So this is a crap sounding symbol, but purposefully so. Retro styly. Mono 2, I think that sounds like 10 bit to me. And the customary delay and huge reverb. But the star of the show, of course, is the aim and break. So what I've done is I've chopped it up in the old school way. I just basically cut to the different transients and I've got a whole bunch just stuff laid chromatically and basically each transient cut to the transient and then drag it out so it plays the loop in full. This for me gives you the most kind of performing inspiration whereby you're not actually having to program each part of the loop, it's, it's playing itself, but you're just triggering different aspects of it. And here's my take on the aim and break. This is how I've organized the loop if we just have a little look here. I've then toughened it up with some EQ. Hyped the transients with a bit of compression. So it's just a little bit more bite. I've then also included this single band thing, but this is, as you see, with the uh, automation here for little fills. Made fun with this filter. Another one there different filter shapes, same fill pattern. Not wanting to overcomplicate stuff, be too fancy. Then the standard procedure, because the loop is pitched way up, as you can see here, uh, let me just take it down close to where uh, the original pitch is. It loses a lot of its bottom end, so what we tend to do is add in an additional kick, and I've added in an, an 808 style one but I don't want to go full bandwidth hip hop. You've got to keep it in the chest because the bass, the bass line is actually created traditionally with these kind of drum and bass tracks with a drum that goes beneath the kick. So you've got to keep the kick in the chest. Got a couple of snares as well. That's a bit kind of floppy around the edges. It's got a nice bright edge to it. So I've also added something with just a little bit of bottom end. And then I've got a combination of this Orbis loop that's heavily high pass filtered. Alongside some very crudely programmed hi-hats. So let's hear that without the aim and break. And then with. You'll notice the cymbals run throughout. It is part of the hip hop tradition, but it's also very much born out of breakbeat. Breakbeat's all about the ones, it's all about those looping phrases that tend to have a cymbal on the ones. So don't fear the cymbal on this kind of stuff. And then down to the 808 here, and I believe it was Danny, LTJ Bookham, who came up with the concept of using an 808 as an actual bass line. So changing the pitch of the kick drum as a bass line. And this is why you'll hear it needs to go below this kind of kick that's here. This is, this is in the sub-regions. And you'll hear there's all sorts of syncopation with the actual kick. That's basically all of part A. And then I just take it to, I don't know if I'd get away with this back in the day. I don't know if this is just like really cheesy or if it's kind of uplifting or if it's just a bit corporate, but I was inspired by this sound on the Novation Summit. And then I doubled it up with Tundra flat handos high and low. It 
just bucket loads of reverb on. Notice these little glitches again, it's being caused by these AU pitches. I've been altering the pitches. Again, that idea of imagining these things coming from vinyl and being pitched crudely up and down in order to fit the tempo. I've also added the XS24 with nothing loaded. When you don't load anything into Logic's host sampler, it has a beautiful sine wave. This just to give it a bit of bottom end. So let's have a listen with the strings. No new material from Orbis th until this rather rude moment here. I'm going to take off my muck. Mummy made a mistake in my underpants. The minute I hear a sound like that, uh, I just hear distortion. Got to put a bit of distortion on it. And then I've just uh, really drawn the, the nastiness, the top end out there. So this is just a, a real incidental. My humble apologies. And then there's this just extraordinary sound in Orbis, okay? A again, a combination of the team finding these amazing recordings made by David Fanshaw and then just messing them up. And I've messed it up even more. So let's have a listen to this. <laughs> I've EQ'd out the really nasty edge. I've got really taken it to the edge. Ouch. And then a little bit of delay. I'm not delaying the bottom end, I'm just delaying the top end, and that's important here to keep the definition, to keep it fat and tight down below. And I've done the same with a reverb. Now, usually on a bass like this, you wouldn't add reverb, but the great thing about these fab filters is it's very easy and intuitive to filter off the bottom end. And this is something that I don't see people doing that much, is, is understanding that you can actually change the character of the reverbs that you're using to fit them around your mix. I want it to sound wide on this bass sound, but I don't want it to sound boom and muddy down below. It adds a drama to it that makes it feel like a kind of a, a, a bass siren, if you will. The last thing to talk about is just very briefly how I've rooted stuff. I've got all of the drums going to this auxiliary, kind of a mastering compression there, a fat one. Uh, just a little bit of corrective surgery going on here. Just a bit of lip filler here and a bit of liposuction here. And then, of course, the, the L3, which I'm being quite confident with. I've also got the rest of the mix going into Auxiliary 3, and it's this that I've got automated here. So basically the reason for doing that is it cuts the reverb tail, so it's literally like flinging the mixer left for this, uh, I think it's a fill that comes in there, and it's that nasty swell that comes in at this point. I've then got it going to this output with some mastering stuff on it. So again, boosting the bottom end. Now this is going to be interesting because this is the first time I've done a track like this since being in the shed. And whilst I've figured out the shed and its idiosyncrasies for orchestral, I'd be very interested to, to get your feedback on how this is translated to your system with particular attention to if I've got the 808 balanced right. It's not really even about the amount of kind of frequency boost or scoop, it's actually just, are they too loud or too quiet? It feels very bassy in here, but I, it, the bass is kind of quite hyped because the ceiling is so low. So a bit of EQ, uh, just a, a snutch of just, just sausage meeting compression. And then again, quite a confident amount, much, much, much more than I would put on orchestral of louder rising here. Thanks as always for watching and for all of your enthusiasm surrounding Orbis. It's, it's a very proud moment for us and it's a great honour to have worked with the Fanshawe estate and these wonderful recordings, these traditions, these cultures that have long since left this earth. And I do hope for those of you who have bought Orbis, that you find inspiration for music 
well into the future and to indeed inspire your audience. Thanks as always for watching. We read the comments below, so do let us know how this sounds to you and anything else you'd like to hear about the library. We may be able to help you out in the comments. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please do. There's loads of exciting insights coming up soon and ding that bell if you want to be notified the next time we put a video up. One of those for David Fanshawe and the David Fanshawe estate for allowing this legacy to be with us here today. Thanks for watching. See you next time.